So that's that's what makes it hard for me. So as I'm training, I'm, I'm very thirsty. So hopefully I get extra exercise for that. And um, basically, um, I started my own gym. I started my own gym about two years ago to, to help the kids in the community and um, in Bay Ridge, the heart of Brooklyn, um, mostly Muslims there. And um, basically to give other people the dream that I had. I started boxing when I was eight years old. I made the Olympics. Um, I'm an undefeated pro now. Alhamdulillah, everything's going good. And I want to give other kids the opportunity that was given to me. And um, so a lot, a lot of kids come to my gym and they're all running around going crazy. But uh, I, I love it, because when, when I look at them, I look at when, when I, the way I was when I was young. It was, it's the same thing. So um, I just want to say alhamdulillah for everything that's been going on, everything successful for me, and I just, I just thank God for, it, for everything. I, I look forward to, to eating and, and praying with everybody here. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. If you guys have any questions for Brother Saddam, you guys can ask them, raise your hand. Uh, if sisters, if you guys have any questions, you guys can write them on the index cards and give them to uh, some of the sisters that are upstairs, uh, and they'll bring them down. Uh, anybody have any questions? No? Yes? Next up we have Sister Ibtihaj Muhammad, who I believe is here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sister Ibtihaj is an uh, American safer fencer and a member of the United States fencing team. She was the first Muslim American woman to compete uh, for the United States in an international competition. Uh, she has a wireless mic upstairs, uh, so the sisters who are upstairs, you guys can see her and the brothers. Inshallah, we'll move on to Brother Hussein and Hamza Abdullah. Uh, Brother Hussein and Hamza Abdullah played professional football in the NFL and played for seven, four years respectively. Uh, uh, Brother Hussein has spent all four professional years with the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, Brother Hamza has spent all of his time in Tampa Bay, Cleveland, Denver, and most recently uh, the Arizona Cardinals. This year, however, they both are putting their NFL careers on hold in order to do their Hajj. Uh, this Ramadan, they're visiting masjids across the United States to share their stories with the community. This is really an opportunity for us. You know, they're giving up their, their, their livelihood for a year for them to go to Hajj. Uh, and may Allah SWT will on their work. Uh, and that's what they do for the uh, You know, they're not part of the Super Bowl champions here in China, so. Inshallah, next week. special teams player, two as a starter. Um, inshallah, this year we are planning to go make Hodge. Uh, we made some of back in March, and we had uh, very strong intentions. We got to go out there and see how everything was and kind of put life into perspective and, you know, what our, our number one goal is. Uh, we, we very, very made plain and simple. So inshallah, this year we're going to make Hodge. Um, in that time span, we said we have a lot of time in between July and October, and we should really 
go out and do something that would be very beneficial for us and inshallah be beneficial for the Muslim Ummah uh, in America as well. So we decided to go around and visit the different masajids and just to kind of see how Muslims are doing in America, just to, just to be able to see the youth, talk to the youth, um, see what's going on, anything we can help out with, any kind of problem, any kind of advice we can give. Um, that's kind of been our goal behind this trip. And alhamdulillah, we've been, I mean, we started in Anaheim, California, made our way to Los Angeles, up the West Coast, back down, across, and now we're here in, in New York. And I will say that the Muslim women are doing well. We're doing, we're doing a lot of good things internally in each and every community. Inshallah, our next step will be bringing it to a national level to where we can start communicating with uh, multiple cities and multiple states and not just our brother and sister that are directly next door. But alhamdulillah, it doesn't seem like we're doing that well because we don't get a lot of publicity and press and that's what we always look to the news to find out new different things. But we've been we've been driving in a van. Is it better now? We, we've been driving in a van for the whole month of Ramadan, and I, we, can, we can tell you that, alhamdulillah, we are doing a lot of good things. So regardless of the situation, um, make sure you, you stand firm and, and you definitely hold in. And I, I would say one thing that, that I've been trying to reiterate as we go on this tour, especially to the youth, and it applies to those older than us as well, is to really protect your inner circle, your inner circle of friends. And, limit your influences. Um, I, I can tell you a story. When I was growing up, I had a friend in kindergarten, and I've known this, know, knew this guy all the way through the eighth grade, and we always hung out. Um, as we got to high school, my father would no longer let me hang around this guy anymore. And it took me a while, but eventually I realized why. This guy was chasing drugs, chasing girls, chasing alcohol, um, ditching school. Uh, cussing out coaches, talking back to teachers. And so our lives started going in two separate paths. And he ended up not even, uh, he was a good football player, he ended up not getting a scholarship, not going, not even to a junior college. And alhamdulillah, I was able to get a school right scholarship to Washington State University. Five years later, I come back, I'm getting ready to prepare myself for the NFL. I see this guy at a store called Smart and Final. And I mean, you can just see the way drugs took a toll on him from the inside out. And he's deflated, his body was eaten up. You know, it was all because of guidance. I was able to listen to my father and know that he was right and I was wrong. That was a time when I couldn't choose my friends. So I let him choose my friends for me. As I got to college, I had no, par I had no parents around. So now I had to learn how to weed out my own circle. So I, I kind of disestablished the rules. If I want to invite this person to my home, I mean, we, I'm, I'm not going to let him in my inner circle. We all know non-Muslims, and we all know Muslims that can be a good or bad influence. But you really have to ask yourself, does this person have the same goals as me? Are they, and if I hang around with this person, are they going to help me get to Jannah? Because that's our ultimate goal. Because there's going to be a time when none of us is here. We're all going to be down in the dirt. That's the reality of the situation. So the people you keep, the people you hang around with, you ask. Are they going to help me get to Jinnah? He said, I'm going to go to Jinnah. It doesn't matter if you have a billion dollars or you have a penny to your name. At the end of the day, you're going to end up in the dirt. We all end up in the grave. So we have to keep that in mind. We all have our different situations, but I want to get to Jinnah. And I want to see everybody else in Jinnah as well. All the stuff we read about the, the hellfire and the torments and punishments, I don't want anybody to go through that. So make sure the people that you hang around with that's the way they think as well. Because then when it goes time to do, do something uh, juvenile or put you in a situation where you don't want to be in, they, they'll know, I'm not going to fall the same for that or I'm rolling with the same where so where he's not going to do that. They're going to they're gonna keep us in your best interest. So I really urge you guys to look at, look at your inner circle of friends and to, and, and to definitely weed out the ones who, who you feel are bad influence. I mean, there's, there's, tons of, there's tons of things that we, we can talk about. I, I can see the situations uh, right around here. And it was kind of similar when we went to Detroit. A very rough situation, a very rough neighborhood. Especially in Detroit, it was almost as if people just forgot about it. 
Like nobody cared for them at all. And all they had was their song. But that's more than the richest man in the world has. Someone told us Donald Trump has his own zip code. And you're like, man, I wish I could have my own zip code. But he has all that money, all of that, and all he has is a zip code. It, it says that, inshallah, we, we attain paradise. Your house, your house alone will be better than the world and everything in it. This man has been working his whole life, and all he has is a zip code. We're working, we're, our goals are bigger than that. We, we strive for things that are way bigger than that. So you live in the right situation. But remember, you have your son, and that's more than anybody else in this world has. As long as you hold firm to the rope of God, I mean, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be far greater than anybody else. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to my brother Hamza, and inshallah, I'd, I'd love for you guys to bounce any and every question off of us because I know there are certain things that you guys want to hear and you guys need to hear in this community. So after Hamza speaks, we, will, we can definitely have a, a Q&A. And don't, really, don't hold back. Because any kind of advice you can give, we'd love to give it to someone. My name is Hamza Abdullah. Uh, as the saying said, uh, I'm his older brother. Uh, I played in the National Football League for seven years. Uh, it was the highest level of professional football, but that is not the goal for me. As the saying said, we are trying to attain the highest achievement. And inshallah, that is seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he said, also, inshallah, we have put off the, the, the beginning of the season. We are not retiring, we are not canceling our entire season in the NFL, but we would like to, uh, we'd like to go for Hajj. And you know, Hajj uh, comes during the football season, so in order to go, then we would have to uh, put, put away something. It was football or faith, to be quite honest with you. And we figured, you know, Hajj is a once in a lifetime thing, so let's go for that, inshallah, we'll work hard enough to make dua. And inshallah, Allah will bless us with the NFL again. So some people would say, you know, you guys are crazy. You guys are absolutely crazy. We've heard that. You know, to give away whatever type of money it is, whatever, whatever you can dream of, whatever you can think of. You know, I've seen people with a lot of money. And that would, and that's what, you know, the, the Times Square, that's what America, that's what they want us to chase. They want us to chase the dollar bill. They want us to say, you know, you don't have what we're saying has. So you have to work harder. You know, I live in California. My mother, she lives right next to a freeway. There's not one second of the day where no one is on that freeway. Not one second of the day. Why is that? Because they're racing towards the dunya. They're racing towards the dunya. And when I talk, I'm talking to myself. I'm not up here saying I'm some perfect person. I'm not. I'm the furthest thing from perfection. I'm trying to work every single day, every single day to get better. Every single day to get better. Now you think about, you know, if I ask the question, you know, what would you do for a million dollars? What would you do for a thousand dollars? What would you do for ten thousand dollars? I'd be anxious to see, you know, what your response is. Ten million dollars, is that a lot of money? I mean, can we agree that's a lot of money? Fifty million dollars, can we agree that's a lot of money? One hundred million dollars, can we agree that's a lot of money? That's a great reward. Do you know what the reward of coming to the Masajid for Fajr and Isha prayer are? Would you crawl to the Masajid doors for $100 million? $500 million? A billion dollars? There's not one person in this Masajid that wouldn't crawl to this Masajid, I don't care where you live, for $100 million. There's not one. But if, just think about that. But if we knew the reward for Fajr Salat, we would come here even if we had to crawl. The money, we can't take the money with us. But the ajr, the good deeds, that's what we can take with us. Why do you think there are people committing suicide? All these bankers, Wall Street bankers, 
30 million dollars, 50 million dollars, some of them billions of dollars committing suicide. There's no bar in that money. You can, only, you can only drive one car at a time. You can only sleep in one bed at a time. You can only wear one pair of shoes at a time. Let's not be wasteful. We are Muslims. I'm sure you guys are aware of all the situations of our, of our brothers and sisters around the world. Syria, Burma, you know, Palestine, all these different situations. And you know, we think we have it bad. So we have to make go for ourselves and for our Muslims around the country. This is a brotherhood. This is a real brotherhood. You know, when, you, when we come, like Hussein said, we've been going around the country. There's one thing that's universal. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Regardless of where we go, we come in these same lines, form these same ranks, bow down to the same God, say the same Bismillah. That will never change. That will never die. But when we stop at a border, we have to what? We have to exchange our money. Oh, your dollar is not worth this. If your dollar worth the ajah of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah never deteriorates. So hold fast to that. You know, you see us and you say, oh man, those guys are up here. I want to be like that. No, 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 no. You want to be like your father. You want to be like these brothers in the Masajid, these sisters in the Masajid. The brother who cleans the mosque, who cleans the mosque, who's here every single day. The brothers who on the front row on the right side. The sister who, kick, who cooks if talk. That's who I'm trying to be like. That's who I'm trying to be like. Why do you think there are uh, celebrities and athletes coming to Islam? The bankers, you know, all these people, all these professions, lawyers, doctors, surgeons, coming to Islam. Because they aspire to be like you. You aspire to be like them, they aspire to be like you. They have the American dream. They have all the fancy cars, they have all of the money in the world, but there's no edge. There's an emptiness. When they lay down and they go to sleep, there's an emptiness. The, you know, when you talk about going to paradise, the, the people who are into paradise are the people who have the lowest amount of money, the poor people. Because they don't have to answer to anything. You know, what did you do with your wealth? I had no wealth. Okay, this one. Alhamdulillah. I'm saying talking about the richest man, you know, one of the richest men in the world. So he gets to say, yes, I have, a, I have zip code. His hair is falling off, you know? Everything is falling off. Everything is deteriorating. He pays $100,000 a month on child support or something like that. You know, there's, he's, and he's constantly working. You see him. You would say he is successful. That's what we would say. If we had to paint success, we would say in the American eyes, he is successful. But where is the edge of you get more edge if you gave the ten dollars a cocktail filter than he would ever have with that five hundred million dollars or whatever it is he has. So continue to say Alhamdulillah. All praises are due to Allah. You know, I was texting someone earlier today, and you know, they asked me, I can't even remember what they asked me. But I said, just promise me this. Promise me and say this Allah with me. So oh Allah, every single step that I take. Please bless it to be a step closer to you and a step away from evil. Oh Allah, please bless every step that I take to be a step closer to Jannah and a step away from Jahannam. Oh Allah, every step that I take, make it to be in good, to be the sake of you, the sake of doing well, and leave off the things that do not matter. You know, we have to continue, continue this brotherhood. This is, mashallah, this is beautiful. Brothers and sisters in the Masajid. Alhamdulillah, you guys have a great structure. YM does beautiful things. So there's no complaints. There's no complaints about lack of programs, about lack of leadership. MashaAllah, you guys are beautiful. This is a very beautiful community. This is the safe haven. This should be the safe haven. You know, when you look outside, you look down these streets, it's a lot of fit, a lot of distractions. You know, people would ask, oh, well, what would you do? I'm human just like you. I am not perfect. It's a struggle and a grind every second of every day that I'm walking. And you brothers have to walk down this street every single day. But this is the end result, the Messiah, for the sake of Allah. So inshallah, something happens out there, but you're on your way to the Messiah. Allah, why know where you go? But inshallah, you go straight to Jannah. 
But just imagine if you were walking away or you were walking past the massager. And people ask me questions, you know, man, have you ever been in a situation this and that? A lot of violence, a lot knows best. I'm not perfect. But I have been in situations, I've been in places where I know I'm not supposed to be. And I ask a lot to forgive me. But this is what I think of. What if at that very second, the angel of death was right there for me to call on me? How would I feel? How would my mother feel? How would I feel? So that's why we ask a lot to make the, the best of our, de our deeds the last of our deeds. And inshallah, with that, I know we're going to have a question and answer uh, portion. I didn't want to take too much of your time. You know, if you guys are, uh, you don't want to ask the question, raise your hand, you can always just write it down and you can pass it along. Because there are many questions that uh, I know you brothers and you sisters have. And humbly law, we are here, and we are here strictly for you, strictly for the sake of Allah. We do not get in our car and drive around to get patted on the back. We do not get in our car and drive around so that we can see monuments. Yeah, those things are nice. But we came to see our Muslim brothers and our sisters, inshallah. So inshallah, uh, with that, I will pass this off. Okay, so uh, uh, Sister Ibn Hajj is here, so if Sister Ibn Hajj, if you could turn your mic on. Uh, Sister, again, Sister Ibn Hajj uh, is bio. She's an American Sabre fencer and a member of the United States fencing team. She won, uh, she was the first Muslim uh, woman to compete for the United States in an international competition. So Sister Ibn Hajj, uh, please turn your mic on and then you can speak. She's upstairs. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me today. Um, I'm so sorry that I'm late. We were stuck in a lot of traffic traveling in from New Jersey. But again, a um, uh, big shout out to everyone for coming out and also to the Abdella brothers. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I just wanted to come out and you know see uh, my brothers and sisters in Islam. You know, it's so nice to see all of you. And uh, just give you guys a bit of perspective and insight into what it's like um, to be a um, elite athlete on the international level and as a Muslim woman. Um, it's been a really tough road for me, but uh, alhamdulillah, it's been a really successful and um, enlightening one. I started fencing at about 13. Um, the reason I decided to get involved in sports, um, I have a brother who is always very active, and my parents, um, really wanted my sisters and I to also be involved in sports. They, they felt like it was a good um, halal, you know, social, uh, or sorry, halal outlet for us to, in order for us to be social and, you know, in Islamic and healthy way. Um, I started fencing and I guess I was good at it. Uh, I'm really, I got a, a scholarship for a university uh, to go to Duke in North Carolina. And um, from, from there, once I, graduated from Duke, I decided to pursue fencing full time, where I did earn a spot onto the United States national team. Um, since then, i you know, traveled to 14 or 15 different countries over the course of uh, three years, and it's been an amazing, amazing experience, and I honestly feel like I couldn't have done any of it without loss of penalty.
I feel like, you know, my journey and I've come full circle in a sense that I'm able to, you know, tell my story and share that with you guys and um, hopefully inspire all of you. Uh, you know, I know that um, covering is not always easy. I know that going to, you know, a, um, growing up in a, you know, not Islamic environment, going to schools maybe you with know, not Muslims, it can be really challenging and really difficult. And I think it's important that we discuss it um, and uh, I think grow from it. I think we can learn a lot from one another in terms of how to handle those challenges and being different. I know that it is, again, very difficult, but um, I, I know that, you know, through sports, uh, it's, I've learned so much about myself and also just how to be more confident, in, you know, being hijabi and being strong, not caring what other people think about who I am or what I believe. You know, I know that um, Allah who almost is, I do everything, you know, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm working toward a specific goal and that's to make it to, uh, to Jannah inshallah. So, um, and you, you don't worry about, you know, what other people think, you, you do it for yourself inshallah, but I don't know that's all I have up here. Thank you. Cool. So, uh, Shalom, we're, we're going to start this question and answer session. Uh, I see some people writing down some questions right now. Uh, if you're comfortable enough raising your hand and asking a question, um, you can do that. If the sisters upstairs, want, someone wants to moderate the sisters' questions, uh, I think the sister that does upstairs, so if you can do that. Um, and then we'll have question and answers for Brother Hamza and Hussein. And uh, they'll sit down too. You guys have boxing questions. You know, I my my biggest question for boxing is, you know, how how do we determine who wins? Because it's all rigged. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. a question for all three, so I guess I answer first. It is, what is your max bench press? And also, <laughs> tips on working out during Ramadan. Well, for my max bench press, I actually don't bench press at all. Because for boxing, when you bench press, yeah, it makes you a little stronger, but it also makes you more stiff and, and slower with your punches. So as a boxer, bench press is, is not what I do. Yeah. I'm more of calisthenics and push-ups, pull-ups, dips, all those type of stuff to make me stronger but also not make me slower in the ring. Um, and tips on working out during Ramadan is um, what I do is I, I try not to think about it. I, I just try to think about when, when it's time for Fatah, I can just drink all I want. Because when I'm working out, I'm very thirsty. I'm not even, I don't even think about food much. I'm just thirsty and I just can't wait to drink. So basically, I just I, I block my mind, I stay strong, and I don't think about it too much. So I'm gonna move on. Thanks. Um, in terms of max bench press, I actually stopped benching because my rookie year I tore my labrum in my shoulder. So I don't have I have limited movement in my shoulders, but it gets to a point. Bench press is over height, man. That's how I think about it. Like, like, like you can do, like you said, push-ups. Uh, 
I use a lot of the resistance bands, and I get way more strength doing that than I do uh, with any kind of push-ups. Uh, I mean, bench press. Uh, this one says, who is harder to cover, Megatron or Fitz? <laughs> um, I play Megatron twice a year, so of course it was Megatron. But Fitz is, I mean, he's no slouch, of course. Uh, let's see, if the NFL season started today, how would you guys be active while fasting? The last nine years, going back to my senior year in high school, we fasted and played football. In high school, it was it was simple because one is high school, so you're playing against kids, and we had night games. Every game was a night game, so I'm only a lot for that. When we got to college, that's when it started to be more difficult because now the the competition level increases, and you're playing a lot of noon games. I, I remember in 2005 we played a noon game at in Los Angeles playing USC. And I wanted to tough again, but not only were we getting blown out, but I couldn't even get a sip of water to uh, quench my thirst while I didn't go for them. But, uh, but we learned how to cope with fasting and playing football. It's actually, you have to learn what your body can and cannot do. Um, you have to take the proper steps of nutrition, hydration prior, prior to that. You have to, I mean, we're big on hydration, drinking water, coconut water. Uh, Gatorades, Pedialytes, uh, started drinking pickle juice as well to keep me from cramping. Sahur, this one had, talks about Sahur. Sahur, in all honesty, I just eat a, a bowl of oatmeal and my fluids and I was good to go. When you, when you try to load up, you get too heavy. It's not, I mean, and it's not, that's not what Ramadan is. You don't go and have a Thanksgiving feast in the morning, 10 to 10 at night. You know, so you, you just uh, get just enough to be able to to fuel yourself, but fasting and playing football is really knowing your body's limits when you when you have to go hard and when you can't exert energy and when you can kind of pro glide. And if you don't know what pro glide is, just imagine going 60 miles per hour and then you see the police and you're in the 55 and you take your foot off the gas and now you're just gliding. That's a pro glide. So you have to know when to pro glide and when to actually go uh, go all out. So. For any of you guys that are playing sports and you're fasting and playing football, make sure nutritionally you're not eating cake, ice cream, fried foods, uh, all the all the fast foods. Leave leave all that stuff out. Eat healthy food. Make sure you hydrate and learn how to provide. Uh, I have a few quick questions. Who is the best fantasy football player to pick? <laughs> you can never go wrong with a running back. A lot of people want the quarterback. And you know, if you go quarterback, go uh, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, and of course, uh, Peyton Manning now that he's back. But I would definitely go with the workhorse running back. No, Eli's not a good fantasy player. <laughs> Eli's just a gamer. I love Eli. Uh, who is a better safety, you or your brother Hussein is? Um, and then the last one is, uh, they said I saw him so I'll say what I can ask uh, When did you decide to take some time off from the NFL, and what was the reason? You know, subhanAllah, so last year, uh, every year, every year the Boston Globe or Tribune or Herald, whatever paper is up there, they send an email, and they send pictures of Hajj and Ramadan. You, you can Google it. But last year they sent some very profound pictures of Hajj. And there was one, one image of a brother making dua. And it, it looked like he was, it, was, it, was, it, was so, it was so much uh, serenity and tranquility. And you know he, you can tell there was nothing else that was better in the world. Regardless of how much money he had, food he had, the, he was getting his nourishment from Allah. And I, 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 really, I really thought about that. And I made my intentions. I, I asked Allah. You know, I said, oh Allah, you know, I, can I go for Hajj? Please invite me to your house. Now, I know, that was in November, so I knew Hajj the next year would be in October. And it's going to be during football season for the next approximately 10 years. So I understand that. So I knew it was going to be, it was going to have to be a number of different circumstances, for, you know, for us to go for Hajj. But alhamdulillah, a lot of different things worked out. And, uh, you know, some things happened, and then Hussein, you know, we made the decision together that inshallah we'll step away for a little bit and we'll go for Hajj and inshallah we'll come back and you know, make do for us that we come back to the winning Super Bowl team. Can't come back to the All right. Um, well, some of
somebody asked me, would you fight Floyd Mayweather? <laughs> if so, how do you think you would do against him? Well, why not fight Floyd Mayweather? You know how much money they're going to pay for that? <laughs> not that it's about just the money, but it's not bad to have some money to, to, to help family and to also give, be able to give charity without breaking your pockets, you know, and um, how do I think I would do with Floyd Mayweather? I, I think I'll do well. Everybody wants to beat the best. If, he, if I beat Floyd, Floyd Mayweather, everybody's going to love me for who I am. But um, you got to have self-confidence. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, Floyd Mayweather, Mayweather will knock me out or beat me up. No, of course not. I don't think that. Of course I think I can beat him. And, and if you don't have that type of heart, then boxing is probably not the sport for you. Of course, I believe I would have to be in the best condition of my life. I would have to be, I would have to be peaking in my uh, career and, and be ready and be on my A game to be Floyd Mayweather. But, but I feel like I can't. Of course, I can't say no. And um, another question: When am I going to see you fight Manny Pacquiao? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know when I'll be fighting Manny Pacquiao, and I don't know who I'll be fighting, honestly. But um, I'm just. I'm on this road, and wherever all it takes me is where I'm going to go. Um, when I fight these guys, why not? What, I mean, what am I boxing for? This, this is what I do. I'm not afraid to fight nobody. Boxing is boxing. It's not, it's not me getting shot. It's not me getting stabbed. It's just a fight. This is a sport, and this is what I love doing. So hopefully one day we'll see. And um, next question is, Saddam, when is your next fight, and will, will we see you on HBO or Showtime soon? Well, um, my next fight is October 27th, and it's going to be in Brooklyn, New York, um, at the ABS Sports Center. I fought on ESPN a couple of times, and I fought on um, undercards of pay-per-view, but this fight, October 27th, is actually going to be aired on um, pay-per-view, pay-per-view channel. So you could see me on pay-per-view, and it's uh, October 27th, so look, look forward to that. And I'm going to pass on and say the last question for all the viewers. So, uh, so if the sisters have any questions, uh, I know you guys have a mic upstairs, you guys can, uh, if you have any questions of the brothers downstairs, you can ask them. Uh, if the brothers have any questions of Sister Tehaj upstairs, you guys can send them up here and I'll read them. Uh, or if, if sisters have questions for Sister Tehaj, you guys can do that too. If you have a question, you can be right now. I'll, I'll give you a pen. Can I borrow the microphone? <laughs> Uh, hello, assalamu alaikum. Walaikum assalam. My name is S.D. Sabri. I am a radio host of Sunset City Radio, internet radio show. And I would like to invite all four of you to our show to basically share your stories of what you've been doing this Ramadan. And I wanted to know if you would be interested. So I'm cordially asking everybody, awkwardly. Yes, okay. Assalamu alaikum. Zakumakai for that awkward invitation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're actually leaving tomorrow for Fajr. Uh, after Fajr, we're going, inshallah, to Park 51 uh, downtown Lower Manhattan. So if everybody is invited, and tell your friends and your family to come for Fajr, inshallah, at Park 51. But then we're going to fill it. So if we could you know, schedule time maybe before then, or if it had to be another time, inshallah. Every Thursday. Every Thursday? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we'll think about that because we have after our Ramadan tour, inshallah, we have you know the month before Hajj, mm -hmm. where we'll be working out and then we'll be doing you know different speaking engagements, and we might actually be on the East Coast, so you know a few MSAs we may be. So inshallah, you know for us maybe we can uh, work something out. It's on the internet, so I'll just call it. Are, are there any questions from the sisters to Sister of the Hajj? Or from the brothers to Sister of the Hajj? Yes, no? You guys have a mic upstairs. Hello? Sorry. Uh, yeah, there are questions. Should I read them? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, are, you, are your team members open to you? And if not, have they just recently opened up? And how did you get them to open up? Um, 
actually, I, I guess one of the untold stories about being a member of the United, what, a United States sports team, uh, like most uh, niche sports or like smaller sports, there aren't very many minorities involved. Um, and um, and uh, you know, it's actually been really difficult. I find I found that. Um, the most that I've struggled has been with my U.S. team members and trying to get them to maybe understand, um, you know, my different practices in terms of not drinking, um, not partying, and, you know, a lot of times when we go to easier tournaments and for in fencing, um, fencing's a lot easier in uh, the Pan-American zone. That means anywhere, anything from Canada down to Brazil. And when we have tournaments in some countries where uh, the competition may be a little bit easier, you do find that you know, your teammates want to spend time, you know, uh, socializing. And it's it's tough because they want you to be a part of the team, but at the same time, that's not, those aren't things that I personally <coughs> indulge in. I don't, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I, you know, don't hang out with them late at night. Um, and I know that that's something that they struggle with. Uh, they want me to be, you know, socially a part of the team, but uh, the, way I, the way I found is that I, I can't, you know, interact with them during that time when, you know, they are inebriated or when they are drinking. Um, also, uh, I, I found that you, I get a lot of underhand comments about being Muslim. Um, I'll tell you one that I don't think is very funny, but you guys may laugh a bit. Uh, one of my teammates asked if he could give my dad an iPod as a dowry to marry me or something like that. And, you know, we all may chuckle a little bit, but those are the type of comments, you know, that I receive. And these are from my U.S. teammates. So, you know, it's tough going to these other countries and having, I do sometimes feel like I'm representing everyone. So I feel like I have to be really strong and, you know, defend every single Muslim woman, you know, with every comment that comes my way. But, um, you know, I, I like to think of myself as, you know, like a pioneer and being like the first Muslim woman to represent you know, the United States in international competition and let everyone know that, you know, we're here to stay and I'm hoping that, you know, we have a few more Muslim women on the team in the uh, coming years, inshallah. Uh, and that question could actually go to, to the brothers too, about, you know, dealing with your with your teammates, uh, especially when you're traveling with the NFL um, and, and how you're able to, to interact with your teammates when, you know, the NFL has sort of a long history of doing foolish things during, uh, during, the, during the week? Uh, yes, uh, the NFL does have a long laundry list. Uh, Thursday nights are usually the party nights in the NFL, and that's the weekend night because we work on Sunday. So Thursday night is probably when you will find uh, a lot of people running around town and in Times Square and doing these different things. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm a creature of habit, and just like many of us, and we have to align ourselves with people who are like-minded individuals. Alhamdulillah, Allah bless me with a brother who's going through the same things that I'm going through. And, you know, we're not sitting up here saying that we're perfect by any means. But just know that, you know, if you make a mistake, quickly repent. Ask Allah for forgiveness. And know what your mistake is. And try to align yourself with a brother that is like-minded with you. And maybe can take you away from that situation. Because if you know, hey, I, if I go with Joe, and I go with Bobby, I go with Tyrone, and they're going to be doing these different things, you know, you try not to go there. But if they have no alternative, then, you know, they, they are more apt to go with them. But if I can come and hang out with Hussein, Saddam, and uh, Omar, and Mustafa, and Muhammad, and different brothers like that, then, I'm more, then I'll, I'm more likely to do those things. So it's all about, you know, trying to eliminate it. Because there's no way that you're going to sit there and say, oh, I'm immune to all this. There's no way. There's no way. I've seen and been in situations that you wouldn't even imagine. You would not imagine. And I wouldn't want anyone, I wouldn't want my worst enemy to be in those situations. But the, the key is for us is to help our brother. Want for your brother what you want for yourself. That's what we've been saying in every tour stop, everywhere we go. And we, inshallah, we'll continue to say that. It was something that our mother raised us on, and we'll continue to say that. That regardless of what my brother does, regardless of what I do, I want what's best for my brother. So if Hussein sees me and I need help, inshallah, he will help me. If I see Hussein and he needs help, inshallah, I will help him. So I would just, uh, with that, we ask Allah for forgiveness and we continue to be our brother's people. Okay, I have a uh, few questions. Some of them serious, some of them are funny. Uh, how 
how does it feel to play a live game with the crowd and the pressure? In all honesty, you just have to block it out and play football. Just worry about what's in between the white line. If you start worrying about this stadium holds 70,000, this stadium holds 100,000, this one's on Sunday night football. I mean, you're going to crack under pressure. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be that simple. Um, this one says, how are you able to cope with heat and thirst in the summer months while fasting and training? Um, like I said before, it's kind of just knowing your limits and making sure you have that prior preparation to so you can be successful. Do you use yourself in Madden? <laughs> <laughs> Madden has actually complicated their gameplay so much. And it's, uh, the gameplay is actually terrible. So I don't even play Madden anymore. I buy the game so I can see myself, but I don't, I don't even play the game anymore. It says, how does the competition, how, how does the competition level increase from college to pro? I think, I think one percent of collegiate athletes, if not less than that, make it to the NFL, and that tells you how much of a select group it is. And I think there's only 1,800 NFL players. So, I mean, it definitely weeds out, and you get the cream of the crop as far as football goes. Then this one over here, uh, I think, is the funniest one of all. How are you able, this is kind of written like a text message. How are you able to refrain from the NFL culture of serial relationships? Now, seriously, digest that and, and, and think about that. The NFL culture of serial relationships. And you, you really have to sit back and say, is that only in the NFL or does that happen all the time? I can tell you from, from where we grew up, that happened all the time. It being in the NFL and you guys seeing it in the media and this person, that person, I mean, that's what the, the TMZ or, or the BOSIP or whatever website, got some website you're looking at, that's what they're going to throw out there. But sadly, that happens on smaller scales in a lot of different communities. So don't just say because it's the NFL, this is what goes on. I'm a married man. My brother's married, my brother's married, and I hang around with people that are married. So these serial relationships that you're talking about, and that's kind of, um, I don't really want to rant, but when we're in Canada, uh, the Sheikh Shazad, we talked about success and defining success. And unfortunately, a lot of people who were born into Islam, we buy into the American dream and what success is based on what they tell us more than anybody else. But at the end, he's sitting there and he's showing us all these different videos. He, he had the uh, Canadian Dow Association. And all this stuff, these guys who had status, who had money, who had these uh, different relationships with women and all kinds of stuff, they, they're like, man, this, this isn't life. This is just so, it's just so empty. I want to be a Muslim. So while we're sitting here asking questions like this, thinking about what they have, they're sitting here looking at you saying, I want to be like you. So as I was saying before, we have Islam. And that's better than anything and everything else in the world. So hold on to that and don't even entertain stuff like this. Okay, um, this question I think goes for all three of us. It says, do you have any hard times from non-Muslims picking on you guys related to religion wise in your own team or other teams? Well, um, for me, I had some people that would uh, have the hate or didn't think I would be able to do certain things. Not not too bad, but they wouldn't think I'd make the Olympics, but which I did. The first Arab American to make the Olympics. The first Arab American to fight for USA in the Olympics. So um, they are some, but for me, not, not too much. Um, is there any question from the sisters? Or to this, from the sister to the sister? Um, well, I think this question can be answered by everyone. Um, you've experienced being out there on an international level. What advice would you offer aspiring Muslim youth who want to pursue something great? And the second part, uh, looking back on your journey thus far, would you have done anything differently? So uh, I, I guess I'll answer first. Um, when I, when I started fencing at um, 13 years old, I had no idea you know, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had in store for me. Um, I didn't know that I would you know, come this far in the sport and you know, um, reach these different levels, but I know that one thing has been really consistent in 
in my life, and that's been my determination and hard work. I'm super competitive. I have a brother um, that uh, comes in the same, uh, he lives in California, not too far from where they grew up. Um, and he's only a few months older than me, and I've always wanted to, you know, jump higher than him, run faster than him. And, you know, we all know that that's tough as a girl to, you know, you know, be stronger or faster than a boy, but I try. And um, when I, you know, step on the fencing strip, my goal is to, you know, literally, like, kill my opponent. I want to beat them so badly, and it's just been ingrained in a part of me. And, you know, a lot of, um, I think a lot of people tend to miss, you know, that, that element. I think that's what separates people who are good and people who are great. You know, it's a lot of hard work. And, for anyone who wants to, you know, who has goals, Olympic goals, um, you know, being in the NFL like these guys, you have to put in the work now. Um, I know that sports has taught me a lot about myself in terms of time management and, um, you know, sur surrounding yourself with good people, making sure that you keep your grades up and um, doing the best that you can on and off the court, I think, are definitely the, the keys to making it um, this and, and being successful in this level of sport. And I'm um, looking back on my journey, would I do anything differently? I, I know that, you know, everything that's happened and everything that will happen, you know, has, has been written. So um, I, I, I don't regret anything. Um, and, you know, looking forward, I just hope for the best. I'll throw it back down to you guys. I would say, in terms of advice, it's a good question. Some of this is good. Um, in terms of advice, don't ever let nobody, no one tell you what you can and can't do. Because there was a time where I was a, I was a, a 110 pound freshman going into high school. I was short. I was the smallest guy. People used to try to pick on me until they figured out who I was on the inside. But people would always say, "You can't do this. You can't do that." You can't play football, you can't play basketball, you can't lift weights, you can't run fast, you're too short, you're too small. I mean, it, it's just fuel. So if anybody says, oh, you're, you're a Daisy, you, Daisy don't do this. Or you're a white boy, you can't jump. Or, or it doesn't matter what it is, they say, okay. And then now, they just gave you fuel to better yourself. So I would just say, don't ever let nobody put you in a box and say, this is who you are. You're defined by this. Absolutely don't don't let anyone do that. Um, I'll start running through some of these questions. Are the brothers married to Muslim sisters? Yes. <laughs> Makes life a lot easier. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you hook us up with some NFL tickets? <laughs> um, we'll work on this one. <laughs> This one is asking if we, oh, and they even put from Heidi, so he wants to know what the, the, Heidi, we got your question. He's asking, did we ever get picked on by uh, non-Muslims in terms of religion? When it, comes to the, when it comes to the locker room, anybody who plays sports, you understand the, the locker room culture and the brotherhood you have, and you understand that nothing is off limits. Everything is talked about, and you have to quickly grow a uh, thick skin. When it comes to Islam, People don't really joke around much. I mean, there may be a pork joke here or there, but that might be all you get. And that was back in high school. When you get on a professional level, it's just more of, because of how you carry yourself, it's more of a respect thing. They have a lot of respect for you. So don't change in situations and say, I don't know, I gotta be this way on this guy. Just be yourself. And they'll actually respect you a lot more for that and whatever jokes or People are talking about it'll, it'll, it'll stop and hurt. What is the process of becoming an NFL player starting from high school? Work hard, man. You just have to, you know, seriously, you have to, you have to grind, you have to study uh, on the field, off the field, uh, working on your technique. Grab a mentor because everybody needs a mentor. Make sure it's a good one because when people don't talk to good people, you're going to talk to somebody. So make sure it's a positive mentor. Um, and it really, it really is just working. It's working and having that will inside to, to be the best. First, be the best so you can be a starter on your team. Then be the best player on your defense or offense. Then be the best player on your team. Then in your city. Then in your state. On and on and on and on until you 
accomplish whatever it is you're, you're looking for. I have more questions, but I'll pass them. All right. Um, one of the questions are, where are you from and what influence you in boxing? Well, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and also my friends are from Yemen, so also from, um, from Yemen. And what influenced me in boxing is when I was about five, six years old, I grew up watching Chris Nassim Hamid as a boxer. And um, when he fought um, Kevin Kelly is when we would push up the couch and really watch his fight. And the way the way Chris Nassim was, the way he comes out, he's, he's an entertainer. He comes out dancing, he fights, he knocks people out. So it, it influenced me to start boxing. So from there I started boxing, so I guess it was nice to see that that really influenced me to start boxing. Um, well, um, I don't really have any locker room experiences, so it says, what was your worst locker room experience? I'm just going to pass this over here and probably just skip that one right now. <laughs> okay, what or how do you handle a situation where you're faced with alcohol? For example, if your team is celebrating, and if you are a woman, my question is for all of you. My question is for all of you, I guess. Um, well, alcohol, when you, when you tell most people, especially Americanized people, when you tell them, at first they're surprised, they're like, well, you don't drink, everybody drinks. But for me, mostly everybody respects it. And it, it's not so hard for me, and like, I'm not like, I don't have like an NFL team like where when we win a big game, everybody wants to go pop bottles and party. For, for me, it's different. When, when I win a fight, it's like I can't even go party and go out after because my, my father is very strict, but I respect it. It's made me who I am now. So I actually just go back home to the family and I just relax and, and get some rest in me. So for the alcohol, it, it's not so hard. Okay, this, this person I haven't even read yet, so let me see what it is. Boxing and football are both very violent sports. Playing on defense, you are constantly hitting players. Yet Islam is such a peaceful religion. How do you balance the two? Okay. You know what? I've actually thought about this before. Because like people were telling me like, oh, boxing, boxing is haram. You know, like you're not supposed, you're not supposed to be punching people in the face and hurting people. I'm like, I thought about it. I'm like, you know, you're right. But then when I heard that, it, it all depends on your heart on how, like, do I go in the ring actually wanting to hurt somebody? Like, do I really want, like, is that in my heart? No, it's not. But when I'm in the ring, I'm, I'm playing a sport. I don't, I don't mean to hurt anybody. I'm not, I'm not punching you in the face to hurt you. I'm just, I'm just defending myself. <laughs> you know, so it's not like, I don't go in the ring like, to break this guy's face. No, I go in there like, I can't wait to score punches, make everybody in the crowd happy, make everybody go crazy, and just win. And if I, if I get a knockout, inshallah, he comes out okay. But and if you and if you think like that, to me it's not halal. But if you go in there, basically, I don't want to put no names out there. But if you go in there thinking like how Mike Tyson thinks, <laughs> Mike Tyson not here. He wants to kill you in the ring. I guess maybe if you go in there like that, it might be a little halal. You know, but if you go in there just to win, it, it's different. And I would pass it over. Uh, I have a bunch of questions. Uh, so I'll run through them really quick, as fast as I can. Who would you rather have as your team teammate, uh, Darrell Ravis or Patrick Peterson? The reason I would have Patrick Peterson is because, inshallah, he will grow up to be better than Darrell Ravis. He has a bigger ceiling. Patrick Peterson set the NFL record for uh, return touchdowns, so he's in a threat in special teams and as well as in defense. Uh, what's the worst thing you've done in your life that you regret? Nothing. Because if that would not have happened, whatever it is that we had in our life, we wouldn't be here today. You know, that had to happen so that we can call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that he is always there. So when our friends weren't there, when they dished us, when they left us, and no one else was there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there and he gave us another chance to repent. Uh, can you give a few words emphasizing on how important prayer and being a pious Muslim is? And that ties into another question that's here. Uh, prayer is the only uh, pillar of Islam that was, uh, that was handed down to the Prophet Muhammad Islam in the heavens, which tells you how important it is. Uh, the first thing that we will be asked about on the day of Qiyam, inshallah, is our Salah. Uh, when you go to Mecca, you know, there is not a call to when your chicken is dead, 
it's a call to prayer. So, you know, we have to understand that there are five things in, in, in our day, five scheduled, five appointments that we have to keep. Uh, so prayer is the number one thing. And prayer, prayer keeps you away from a number of different things. Uh, this question says, may you recite some Quran? Uh, one surah that, alhamdulillah, that I'm, that I'm into right now uh, is Surah Rahman. I, I really enjoy it. And so I'll just say a few uh, ayat. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman wa'allama al-Qur'an akalaka al-insana al-lamahu al-bayan al-shamsi wal-kamara bi-husbani wal-najmu wal-shajru yasjudan wal-sama arafaha wa wada al-mizan al-la taqabu fil-mizan wa'aqimu al-wazna bil-kisti wa'la tuksiru al-mizan والأرض وضعها لن أنام فيها فاخية والنقدات الأكمام والهبد الأصفر الريحان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان. Another one is Can you explain that you can achieve al akhla and dunya at the same time? The most often repeated dua of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes in Surah 2, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, Chapter 2 in the Quran, uh, verse 201. And that says, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnatan wa til akhirati hasnatan wa kina adabu O Allah, please give to me that which is good in this life and that which is good in the hereafter and save me from the fire. So that is our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the one who is our role model, the one who we all aspire to be with. To, to be like, and the one we aspire to be close to, near to Jannah, inshallah. So we can have this life in the hereafter, but do not sacrifice your now for your later. So inshallah, you know, uh, as Brother Saddam said, you know, yeah, you know, if he's fighting Floyd Mayweather, of course he's going to take that fight, because you, you know what kind of good he can do. Now he can provide for his family. Now the different fitness that he may face, that we may face, now it will be, inshallah, easier. As long as there is barakah in those funds. You know, I'm not going to go and hold up a liquor store and gain $500. Where's the barakah going to come from that? Now I'm in jail for five to ten years. Now I'm, I have a wife, I have two young children. Now they're growing up without a husband, without a father. Was that $500 worth it? So it goes back to the company you keep. And then this one, subhanAllah, uh, please share some dawah tips. Uh, and have you given dawah to your teammates? You know, there, there's something special going on this Ramadan. I, I always ask Allah Azza to please bless this to be the best Ramadan. Every year I ask that. And you know, the first year we were covered by ESPN. Hussein was on the cover of Yahoo. The next year we went to the White House for the talk. And this year you're like, man, how can, how can we top that? And alhamdulillah we go in and we meet all these different brothers and sisters in this, in this room. And you know what, subhanAllah, I left, you know, obviously I left, uh, you know, football, but I still have teammates, I still have relationships. And before we went out on the, uh, to speak at the Masjid Masjid al Haq in Detroit, uh, a very famous brother in, his, uh, in the NFL ranks, he sent me a text message. And he said, Hamza, do you have any Qurans lying around? I would like one. You know, so my heart jumped out like, oh, wow, subhanAllah. So, you know, of course, we, we hooked that up. And then last night when I was about to speak uh, at uh, ISBCC in Boston, I got a text message while I was sitting down. Another brother asked me about Islam, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm studying Islam to be a Muslim. So the best dawah that we can do is be ourselves, is be a Muslim. Because they're looking at us, every step that we take. You know, people think that, oh, Hussein, I have to watch Hussein to be a Muslim. No, 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 no. They're going to watch you. Your neighbor sees you every single day. They see Hussein once. They see Hussein twice. So it's upon us to be great, great, great interpreters of Islam, great advocates and ambassadors of Islam. And inshallah, with that, you know, we can continue to strive and be great Muslims and know that, you know, these are my teammates, so they know intimate secrets about me. They know that I'm not perfect. They know you're not perfect. But yet, you still, you get up every single day. You pray five times a day. You still make it to Juma every Friday. They want to know what that feels like. They want to know what it feels like when everyone else around you is going crazy over money, over this, over that, and you're just staying the same thing. You're staying the same plan. 
your women are modest. You know, that's one thing. The sisters, and I commend you, uh, you know, uh, I, I can't see the sisters, but alhamdulillah, you know, I just want to thank you for being the, the pillars of Islam and being an example to, for us and wanting us to be stronger in our game. Because if we walk down the street, you know, if me and Hussein walk down the street, people just look, they, they won't look twice. But a sister, she represents Islam, she represents modesty, she represents beauty. That's true beauty. So it's upon us as brothers to protect our sisters so that they can feel comfortable. So that when they come to the massage, they feel comfortable. And inshallah, I'll pass that to the same thing that brought the question. Okay, some of them, would you play for Rex Ryan? Yes. <laughs> Which word should we talk to most smack? Steve Smith. <laughs> Do you have a chance without AP? AP is bad. Is Ponder going to have a great new season? Inshallah. Uh, let's see. Please come to the Giants and the Jets. Tell the GM to sign. I'm the Hussein and Jordan. What did you want to be when you were very young? In all honesty, I wanted to go to gender. My mother told me about it. I said, that's what I need to be. <laughs> um, do you guys hang out, meet other Muslim athletes and celebrities? Obviously, we're just starting. <laughs> um, the whole, this one goes back to when he said, what was your worst locker room experience? I really, I really don't have any because, I, I mean, I do my job and I get out. All the other foolishness stuff that goes on, I mean, I may look at it, laugh at the guy who's doing random stuff that they know they shouldn't be doing, and then I head home. This one is a good one. It talks about uh, what advice can you give to parents who are raising their kids here in the U.S.? This is, this is an easy one and a difficult one at the same time because it depends upon the child. Because the parent, the parent definitely has a tough job. They have to provide. They have to go out, they have to work, they have to protect the child, but then also the child, you have to, just like we have to learn how to take coaching, the child has to learn how to take coaching. So we were born in Los Angeles, California. Um, my mother moved us to Pomona, California, which was a nicer area at the time, but it quickly, it quickly turned. So for us, they taught us a lot of good things inside the house, but it takes a community to raise a child. So when we got outside of the house, we, had, we, kind of, we kind of had to put on our armor. We had to put on our, I mean, you had to carry yourself in a certain way so you didn't get approached by different gangs, you didn't get jumped, you didn't get picked on, all of that jazz. So for us, it was really just listening to our parents. And it's easier said than done because it took a while for us to say, you know what, they're telling me, they're, uh, what my father's telling me, I need to listen. For me, I was very hard headed. They gave me a lot of good things and a lot of good tools, but I felt I still had to feel the world before before I can actually listen. So my senior year in high school, when I was getting all those letters from different schools, I had UCLA calling me, Pete Carroll from USC coming to see me, and I have Washington State, I have letters from Hawaii, I have all these different places saying, come to my school, you're, you're, you're a good football player, come play football for me. So I started getting a little big headed. Next thing you know, I started getting in trouble. My dad said, okay, I got something for you. Go dig out that tree stump in the yard. I'm like, what? Go dig out the tree stump in the yard. So now, instead of hanging out with friends, instead of going out kicking it, doing whatever, playing video games, I'm out there doing, doing, doing hard work, manual labor, for no reason. Dig out a tree stump, what's next? Go do the other one. Okay, do that one. Okay, what's next? Turn over the whole backyard as if we're gonna plant a garden. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm out there, and every time I come home from school, I go to practice, and then I have to turn over the yard until the sun goes down. And, I turn it all, and I'll turn it over, and then I have to take out every blade of grass. Every single blade of grass. It was painful. And then I'll take it out, and then you know what? And I'm thinking we're going to put, like, because we had a garden before, I'm thinking we're going to plant some corn or some water, or some, just something. No, he said, my little brothers and sisters, they run outside, they trample all over the ground, they flatten it back out, he said, go turn it over again. <laughs> so for me, I was like, you know what? I gotta stop getting in trouble. Because this is dumb. <laughs> I'm tired of getting in trouble. I can be doing so much more stuff. I can be doing fun. I can, I can go play basketball, ball, go play football, go to the movies, go, go hang out, do whatever. But instead, since I'm getting in trouble, I'm sitting here at, in the backyard in 100 degree weather, <laughs> swinging a pick for no reason. It, I mean, Seriously, I really had to get over it myself 
and start taking the coaching from my parents. So for the parents out there, you you know what how you want your child to grow up. Don't I would say don't get so bent on one thing because if my dad forced me to be a basketball player, I mean who knows where I'd be right now. I'm a short guy. I, I don't know if I can make it in basketball. But he put us in football and we loved it. So we seen that we loved it. So then he let that grow inside of us and he started guiding us in that direction. But it wasn't like he said, you're going to make it to the NFL. I'm putting all my chips in on you. You're my 401k. You better go get it done. He didn't, he didn't do that. He just said, I'm going to put you guys in football because I want you guys to be tough. And then he seen us having fun in it. So he said, okay, let's see where this goes. And I'm pretty sure that's how most successful people are. They didn't go into it saying, one day I'm going to be in the NFL. Or, I mean, you do, but it starts off with just, just something small. And whatever your child takes to, as long as it's allowed and as long as it's good, help them be successful in that. Because as soon as you say, no, I don't want you doing this, then they're going to try to find an alternative. So make sure you have a lot of alternatives for your child. And there's some form of discipline that gets through people's head. Mine was doing all that manual labor in the backyard. And I don't know what it is for other people, but find it and, and kind of tweak it to whatever, <laughs> however your parents decide it is. So inshallah, we'll have a question from upstairs for Sister Tehaj, uh, and then after that, I will have something to say. Okay, um, we have a few questions. Why did you choose fencing? Did it have anything to do with you being a Muslim woman, and why not a different sport? Um, as a kid, I played uh, tennis, I did softball, I ran track, um, but as you know, in all those sports, you're not fully covered. And I was really young, around like, I don't know, anywhere between eight and 10, but um, when I was, I think around 12, I was driving past the local high school and my mom noticed some kids inside and they were fully covered from head to toe. They had on a mask, you know, a long white jacket and long white pants and they were fencing. And at the time she didn't know what sport it was, but she knew um, that that's what she wanted me to do when I got to high school. So a year later, um, then the fall when I was 13, I went out for the fencing team, and that's how I got involved in fencing. My mom wanted me to play a sport that didn't, you know, hinder uh, the practicing of, you know, being a Muslim, being a Muslim woman. And I'm not here to say that fencing is for everyone, but I know that for me, I wanted to play a sport where, you know, I would feel a uniform and be a part of the team. It was the first time in my life, you know, I felt really a part of the team, you know, as as a guy, it's easy, you know, for them, like um, I think uh, Hamza said earlier, you know, when they walk down the street, no one knows, you know, that they're Muslim, and for us, we wear it, you know, um, in our hijab, everyone knows that we're Muslim, and um, when I'm fencing, I, once I put my mask on, I do look like everyone else, and it's, it was, I think the easiest time I had as an athlete in terms of fitting in with the team. Uh, and why not a different sport? Again, and for that reason, it was just really easy for me, I guess, to um, be a fencer. Um, what made you choose to be a saber fencer over epi and foil? Um, there's three different weapons in fencing. I won't get into specifics, but um, epi is the slowest of the three, and that's what I did for my first three years, actually, that I fenced. It's full body target. You have to be a lot more patient. Um, just my personality, I'm very aggressive. I like to win, extremely competitive. So I did make the change to Saber, which I'm sure some of you guys have seen. Um, it's been on NBC and on MSNBC for the Olympics. Uh, it's very, very fast paced. And you have to, you want to, you know, be a step ahead of your opponent. And fencing, they say that, um, you know, fencing is a physical chess. You know, you want to tactically be a step ahead of your opponent. So I like how quick thinking you have to be in, as a Saber fencer and also, uh, I guess, the speed and agility of it. Uh, next question. Um, how did you feel after you joined the U.S. national team? Um, I, throughout my life as an athlete, I've always set goals for myself. Um, back when I was, you know, 17, I wanted to win a state title. I wanted to go to a good university. I wanted to, you know, make a, a U.S. national team. I wanted to win a U.S. national title. And alhamdulillah, I've been able to accomplish all those things, but I've never set, you know, these huge lofty goals. When I was 17, I never said, you know, I want to be on an Olympic team. That wasn't necessarily in my, you know, um, 
kind of thought I set goals that I thought were attainable. Um, I knew that I could, you know, win a national title. I knew that these things would come, but they would come with hard work. And um, once I was able to, uh, you know, earn my spot on the U.S. national team, um, I honestly, I was on cloud nine, I hope you It was such a, a huge feat for me. Um, and, you know, not just for me and as a Muslim woman, but also as an African-American um, woman. There had never been, you know, an African-American woman on um, the United States men's team before in my weapon. So, um, you know, there were a lot of, I think, um, different landmarks that I had that I had reached just in terms of being not only African-American woman, but also a Muslim woman as well. And um, have you ever had any confrontation while fencing one of your matches while in a different country? Uh, they don't necessarily come when, you know, you're on the fencing strip. Uh, they come in different forms. I, I think that all of us know if you have, um, a, a, you know, an Islamic name, my name is going to be that as you guys know, or like, you know, um, Saddam or whatever your name is. It's very difficult uh, to even go through the airport. I always say that, you know, when I go to the airport and have to deal with the TSA, it's like my daily massage. You know, I always get that random surge where you get that pat down and, um, uh, my toughest experience has been at the airport in Belgium. Uh, the, the security told me that I, in order to board my plane to go back home to the United States, I would have to take off my hijab. And immediately I froze. And for the first time, I mean, for those who know me, I'm, I'm never at a loss for words. Uh, but I was shocked. I didn't know what to say. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And alhamdulillah, it was one of those competitions that my mom was with me on. And she never comes to competitions, but she was there. And she immediately took over, and the guy didn't speak English, we didn't speak Flemish or French, but she explained to him, you know, she was like patting her head and showing him, this is what we do in the United States, we don't have to take off our scars, and, you know, he yelled at us, he said, if you want to get on this plane, if you want to go home, this is what you're going to have to do. Um, I think after him and my mom going back and forth, my mom stayed really calm, uh, which I, I think is very commendable, because I was like literally two seconds away from crying. Um, you know, they ended up taking us into a back room and letting us like do our own self pat down and come to the library we to board the plane and get home in one piece. But those type of scary moments do happen. And um, you know, you just have to be strong. Like I said, I'm just really, really hopeful and praying that there are so many more Muslim women and Muslim athletes to come after me because it's such an amazing experience just to and see, you know, different parts of the world and experience so many different things. Um, as I guess as a United States athlete. So, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna stop the questions here. Uh, we're passing out dates and water. I think all the brothers got it. The sisters should be getting dates and water now. Uh, we have until 8:06, um, but there also were donation boxes being passed around. The cost of this event was almost four thousand dollars, just because of iftar alone it was you know almost three thousand dollars. So, uh, anything you guys can give in terms of donations. Um, Anything that's over the cost of what we cost to put on this event will be going towards the Lion Retreat that we're having in, in August. Uh, so if anyone, you know, if everyone can please, uh, the donation boxes are here. Please feel free to give as much as you can. Um, and then, you know, just, just, you know, remember that the cost of this event was almost $4,000. Uh, and we have food for everyone as well. Uh, we're going to have a, a short meet and greet. We only have six minutes. So if you don't have wudu, you can go make wudu now uh, because that's the only wudu area, so that's going to get crowded pretty quickly. If you uh, already have wudu, you can come and meet the guys uh, and the sisters. You can go meet uh, Sister Abdihaj. Uh We ask you guys to do it extremely cordially. Uh, you know, salam.